Okay, so um, it's a pleasure to introduce Dr. Harrison. You know, we haven't met before, but this is going to be the, uh, uh, the occasion. So. Um, so she arrived at Strasbourg University in 2016, I think started teaching in the fall. And she teaches English literature, composition, and creative writing. And well, one of the things that I found it very interesting that she completed her PhD in children's and Victorian literature in Arbor Iswet University in Wales, United Kingdom. But she's a local, I learned. So that's a very interesting story. I hope that she talks about that too. Um, <laughs> yes. And then, of course, had a training uh, as a um, secondary school English teacher. She has taught English to students at all levels of education, from nursery school to graduate study. So uh, that's a lot of wisdom, I guess. You have to share that with us. So she focuses on three primary areas um, in young adult literature, environmental studies, posthumanism, and materialism. So she's an editor for the peer-reviewed children's literature and journal, uh, culture journals. Uh, um, how do you say it again? Jeunesse. Jeunesse. So my French is not good, sorry. Um, as well as the children's book review website. She's currently working on an edited collection on Winnie the Pooh for the University Press of Mississippi, as well as another book on young adult dystopia for the Lexington Books. So she's also writing a blog on children's literature studies, the worrisome words blog. So I give you Dr. Harrison. Okay, well, thank you very much for joining me here today. I apologize if you guys at the back struggle to hear me. Um, I'm struggling a little bit to talk. So please, if you need to ask me to speak up, do so. Um, this presentation has kind of arisen out of a series that I ran on the Worrisome Words blog, and it was looking at how educators in the Pashi schools, in the Pashi system, use children's literature in their classrooms. And at the time that I made the proposal, it seemed like a great idea. And then about four weeks ago, when I sat down to actually work out what I was going to say, I realized I hadn't got a clue. And in that way that you do when you have no idea what you're going to say in a presentation, I sat and stared at it for a long time and realized that I did actually have a point. And so I'm going to share that now before I forget what it is. <laughs> I have two ideas that I want to get across to you today. The first one is that children's literature offers opportunities for interdisciplinary study. Okay, that's a key idea of this presentation. And the second key idea is that children's literature offers opportunities for adult study in ways that you might not expect. So it is something that can engage readers at all levels and at all kind of levels of thought. So those are the two ideas I really want you to take away from this presentation. <coughs> Excuse me. Okay, so first of all, what is children's literature studies? Um, I call it children's literature studies because it's kind of over the years, um, this is a discipline that started off around the 70s. And since then, it's blossomed from something that was very much focused on literary analysis into something that is much, much bigger and much more interdisciplinary. So it's the study of texts and media. I throw that in because that's really important in our current digital age. Um, texts and media intended for or created by children. It can be either. It can be both. Um, and it includes the history, the reception, the use, and the critical analysis of touch, such texts. So it's not just looking at a children's book and what does that book say and what are those those sayings mean, but it's also looking at things like how do we distribute children's literature, who has access to it, who judges it, um, how does it find its way into our classrooms, what are we leaving out, what is not covered by children's literature, how is the canon formed, how is it produced in our um, consumer culture. Okay. Um, it's also broadened out into related fields, childhood studies, children's culture, writing for children, and so on. So it's almost become an industry of itself. <coughs> And what I've seen since I joined the field only 10 years ago or so is that it's broadened out from education and literary analysis into other fields, starting with history and cultural studies, as you would expect. But now I'm seeing scholars from psychology, sociology, business. Um, at one point, we even had somebody submit an article to Jeunesse who was in maths. And that blew our minds because we had no idea how to deal with that because it was maths. 
Um, but definitely people from other fields are starting to realize that children's literature has something to offer for them. Cognitive science is always useful. You have people from the sciences submit things and then you realize that you don't know enough about it to even know where to look for peer reviewers. <coughs> so for those outside the field of children's literature studies, um, it may not seem like a very big field. Once you get into it, you realize that it is in fact huge. <coughs> Um, like I said, it started off back in the 70s, and it's now um, global. These are different large organizations that currently exist within the academic world of children's literature. So you have at the top there CHLA. That's probably the biggest in the world at the moment, and it is based in the US. So they are probably the largest one. Um, IBBY and IRSCL are both international organizations. Uh, children's Literature Assembly and the CBC, <coughs> they are both <coughs> British. CYRTC is based in Winnipeg, they're Canadian, and this one in red at the bottom, ACLAR, they are um, Australian, but they also cover places like Hong Kong and Japan. So this is a study that is going on across the globe, but it is also very much based around European culture and English language texts at the moment, and that's a place where it really needs to expand further. <coughs> There are a lot of journals that cover these um, topics. Two I want to bring to your attention. This one over here with the lovely orange pistol and um, this one over here. And the reason I bring them to your attention is they both have connections to the PASHI system. Um, the one with the yellow, the orange pistol at the bottom there, that is Jeunesse. That's the one that I sit on the editorial board for. And this one over here, Research on Diversity in Youth Literature, that was only launched a year ago. Um, and Dr. Gabrielle Halko over at Westchester University is one of the editors for that one. So of that number that you can see up there, and I think that covers pretty much all of the large ones in the world that I know of, two of them are being dealt with in the PASHI system, which is interesting. <coughs> <coughs> this just gives you a quick idea of the kind of study programs that are out there if you want to study children's literature. And as you can see, again, there are a lot of them at the graduate level. I've tried to break them down into USA at the top, UK at the bottom, those are the two main ones. And that's the rest of the world in the middle. It's Canada and Australia, two of them. Um, and then also, you know, if you search for children's literature, you'll find hundreds upon hundreds of other single courses, independent research options, and so forth at graduate and undergraduate level. So there is a lot of work being done in this field. And of course, the more students go through these programs, the bigger the other two screens get as more people join the field. And this is what it looks like in the PASHI system. The ones in red are the schools that have children's literature study programs. And the only four of them out of, is it 14 schools up there? Do not have any specialty at all. So California, Cheney, Indiana, and Kutztown, none of their faculty list children's literature specialties at all. But the rest of them do. And you can see at the bottom, Westchester has also started an MA in children's childhood studies. Um, they just started that about a year ago, roughly around the same time that Dr. Halko got involved with the Research and Diversity in Youth Literature Journal. All right, so that kind of begs the question of why. Why is Pashi getting so involved in this field that seems so random and out there? Um, I think, personally, from what I have gathered from the guest posts that people have contributed to the blog series, is that children's literature offers something unique to our particular student demographics. Okay, so when you're not um, Columbia or Yale or Harvard, you have to think about how are you gonna get your students engaged in these very difficult, dense topics that you want them to engage with at a high level. But how are you gonna move them from the level they're currently at to that high critical engagement? You need something that will grab their attention, something that's familiar and yet exciting. And I think children's literature offers that, and I think that is why we are finding it in our system so much. So I'm gonna share with you some of what our own PASHI educators have said about how they use children's literature in their classroom. And what I actually found when I did this was that most of them are using it in education classrooms. So at the moment, we haven't really moved beyond that mindset of children's literature is for teachers and it's for educators to use in the classroom later on. And what I'm gonna then share with you is what's going on outside of the PASHI system 
and how children's literature can be used in different fields, such as criminal justice, which is why I was smiling when you said you were criminal justice, such as criminal justice, such as sociology, such as psychology, how you can bring texts into those disciplines and make those connections. And that's the bit I'm actually hoping where you guys are going to contribute a little bit, because I know from what our provost was asking that we have a lot of different disciplines in the room. I've given some suggestions up here, but I'm sure you guys have a lot more. All right, so this was um, Dr. Anne Dyer Stewart. She's at Bloomsbury University. She's, um, Bloomsbury is not one of our Pashi schools, but it is quite local, I think. So she says um, in the education classroom that the text acts as a bridge between their education um, lessons, their pedagogy lessons, and their literature lessons. So as English teachers, trainee English teachers, they're taking literature courses at the college level and reading grown-up texts and learning how to analyze them and being fascinated by that. But then they're stepping into their education classrooms and they're learning about um, the canon that will be taught in the high school English classroom or the middle school English classroom and they don't know how to join those two things up. So Dr. Stewart found that by introducing children's literature texts, or young adult literature specifically is what she works with, those students were able to bridge that gap and learn how to apply the techniques from one classroom to the text in another classroom. Okay, this is actually someone from the Georgia Institute of Technology. I threw her in there just because her insight was so interesting, and again, it had to do with education. So she's not Pashi, I'm gonna add right away. Um, she found that it was useful in terms of supporting critical thinking skills in gen ed classes, and that was particularly why I thought I would include this, because gen ed is a big part of what we do at ESU now as well. So um, she felt that it enabled a nuanced discussion of audience. So when you think about children, and I'm going to throw this out to the audience, what is a child? So what is a child? Who, who thinks they can answer that? Go ahead. You more or less a blank slate and tell their surroundings and where it comes from, their cultural values and whatnot. Interesting. Okay, blank slate. Any other interpretations of child in here? <laughs> Under age, at a certain age. You want to name an age? Maybe 12. <coughs> Maybe 12. Do you want to revise your definition <laughs> based on that? <laughs> I don't know. No. No? Okay, so blank slate up until the age of 12. Well, it's a more or less a range starting at zero where they really are a blank slate mm -hmm. until they're 12 where they've been... <coughs> uh, Written all over. Mm -hmm. <laughs> all right, I'm going to guess from the fact that most of you decided to say silence on that one that you realize that's a loaded question. Um, obviously, if you're talking about children, we've all been children at some point. Childhood is one of those groups where it is a marginalized group, but it's a marginalized group that everyone at some point is a part of, and that's kind of something that makes it unique. And when you talk about children's literature, there is no one children's literature and there is no one child. It's a very diverse group. It's about as diverse as the number of people there are on this planet. So if you're going to write for children, you have to understand writing for different audiences, multiple different audiences, and different demographics, often many at the same time. So it holds something unique for the composition classroom and for the creative writing classroom. OK, this was our own Dr. Eckhard. She pointed out that young adult literature in particular can help people connect when they have trouble expressing themselves or their emotions. And that's something that I have found particularly true in my own classrooms as well, that often students have come who are maybe not very confident writers and perhaps not even very confident critical readers, but they have a lot of passion. They have a lot of intense feeling about certain topics. Young adult literature, because it's accessible and it's <coughs> familiar, gives an opportunity to start letting those emotions out and think about how they can be communicated. First, in how they are communicated through stories and then how you can communicate them yourself. <coughs> Dr. Tim Oldakowski, I've been trying to learn how to say that for a few weeks now and failing. Um, he shared 
And now this is getting interesting because we're moving away from education. Um, in the English language arts classroom, he points out something similar to Dr. Eckerd, that feelings are an important part of the growth and development of the adolescent. Okay. So now we're thinking a little bit about childhood development and how that links to education and how that links to literacy and then how that links to literary <coughs> interpretation. So he talked about his um, students reading young adult literature and the context of his was specifically with students who had just moved from high school into a college setting. And they were able to identify with the characters and the themes and the issues of young adult literature in particular and then be able to translate those into um, the more classical canonical text that they wanted to study in literature classrooms. Okay, moving on to um, the writing classroom in particular, Dr. Erica Galliotto from Schiffensburg pointed out that um, in order to bridge the gap between writing theory and writing practice, young adult literature um, was something that the students were able to relate to more easily. So it reflected experiences that students were familiar with from their own lives, and that enabled them to find the vocabulary and find the expressions and find the description that they were able to use to express more of what was being asked of them in the classroom. <coughs> okay, even more interesting. So now we're moving even away from literature and writing classrooms, um, or composition classrooms, I should say, Professor Marjorie Maddox at Lockhaven um, actually used children's literature to teach the reading and writing of poetry. So if anyone can remember Roald Dahl from their own childhoods, you'll know that um, if you want to get a good grasp of things like rhythm and meter, children's poetry is a good place to start because it's often very upfront. And um, she found that students would learn the terminology, the technology of poetry much better if they had an obvious example from children's literature in front of them that they could work with before then trying to copy that style and play with that style. I also like the fact that she says poetry is a whole body and mind creative activity just because I remember making my, um, my own children's literature writing students get up and stomp the, the rhythm of the poems that we were looking at in class. They didn't like it very much, um, but it was very instructive. <laughs> Okay, instructor Rachel Hefner Burns, she's at Lehigh, um, and she is in the communications classroom. So we've stepped outside of the English department, finally, technically, a little bit. Um, and she says that it allows for complex explorations of 21st century social crises. This is where it starts to get interesting for me. So these are texts, um, we like to think that children's and YA literature is simpler and easier than grown up literature. It's not. Um, in fact, there was. A little while back when Hunger Games was very, very popular, there was a lot of complaining in the media about too many adults reading children's books and not growing up and reading grown-up books. Um, and actually, if you've ever read some of these YA <coughs> texts, they are horrific and they are complex. <coughs> and they cover a lot of these themes that young people feel very passionate about. And so that is where I think the really interesting stuff is, where you can take children's literature outside of the English classroom. And I am going to give examples of that. All right, so here we go. This is where I think we can branch out a little bit more. So children's literature and sociology. Um, this is a study from the International Journal of Qualitative Methods, which I had never looked at before in my <coughs> life until looking at this particular presentation. Um, but they suggest that these children's books are reflecting particular social themes and um, information about our social structures. And that they're doing that in an accessible and easy to understand way. We understand things through narrative. So if you want to understand a complex social idea or sociological concept, you can look at a children's literature novel and see how that is playing out in narrative. So I've stuck the Hunger Games up there. Because if you want to think about inequality in a society, if you want to think about how civilizations rise and fall, if you want to think about how power dynamics play out or functionalism and how that works in the media, it's a wonderful text for exploring those things. And it makes them accessible because you become passionate and interested in those stories. 
All right, so before I move on from that one, does anyone else have any suggestions for sociology? Yes. I was just going to point out that um, with Hunger Games, that was actually like the first series I've ever read. Like in yep. high school, my <laughs> English teacher was like, um, here's a book, read it. You might like it. And it was the first series that I actually finished like within a two week span. Yep. But the thing I found interesting about Hunger Games is that it showed the dynamics of war yep. like, to a different aspect of just showing that, okay, war is just like you're going to fight it showed the ugliness of it to the extent that people are going to pay attention to it. Absolutely. That's a really wonderful comment. It illustrates exactly what I'm, what I'm trying to say. Thank you very much. Anyone else? Comments on The Hunger Games or on books that you think would help teach sociology concepts? <coughs> no? Okay, I'll leave you to stew over that one because I'll ask for more suggestions at the end of the presentation. All right, so children's literature and criminology. Um, this is actually a degree that is offered by the University of Portsmouth <coughs> and um, I don't know how easy this will be for you guys to see, it's quite dim on the screen, but in their year two, in their core required classes, they have to take youth culture or children's literature. And <coughs> this is a program that asks them to think about the criminal justice system in terms of youth and children's culture together. So the novel that I chose to pair up with this idea is one called Allegedly. Has anyone heard of this one? It's pretty high on the Amazon bestsellers at the moment. Again, it's a YA novel. It tells the story of a young black girl who is accused of the murder of a young white baby who is in the same household and how she then finds herself caught up in the criminal youth justice system and how that impacts her life. It's a very moving, very upsetting book. Um, but as you can imagine, it leaves a lot of scope for thinking about the system as it stands at the moment. It's very well researched, it's very true to life, and so it opens up questions about ethics and about justice. And those are very important, I think, for any discussion of criminal justice and juvenile criminal justice. Um, so again, any suggestions from the audience of other texts that could fit here? No? Okay. Again, I'll leave you to think on that one. Maybe you have more questions at the end. So children's literature and psychology. That was a, just a big old sigh from the room. So everyone knows this one then, yes? All right, so um, <coughs> children's literature and psychology. It has to be where the wild things are, of course. Um, picture books are a great one when you're talking about children's literature and psychology. Obviously, they contain a lot of very deep, complex ideas, but they are not written and spelled out for the audience. They're there to be interpreted and the pictures can be interpreted in many different ways. Um, and obviously, again, when we're looking at child psychology and that you get a little bit into child development as well there, um, and the things that will appeal to children and the things they need to develop health healthy mental and emotional patterns, um, a lot of that can be found in children's literature and the way we react to it. So this one has obviously been analyzed to death. Anyone comments on the where the wild things are? What do you think of it? Do you still like it? I mean, I haven't read it in a while. I mean, <laughs> <laughs> you, you don't keep it by your bed? <laughs> Anyone see the film? Yeah. Yes. What do you think of the film? Yeah. I thought the film was scary. I'm going to admit that. The book's fine. The film is creepy. <laughs> <coughs> All right, children's literature and art. Um, I. I kind of stuck this one up here because it's another project that I'm working on at the moment. Um, obviously, a lot of children's literature contains images, and a lot of it is built around images. You all gasped when you saw the image of the wild things on the screen because we recognize them. We recognize what Winnie the Pooh looks like. We recognize Tigger. We recognize um, Peter Rabbit. These figures are iconic because they are connected to images as well as words in our heads. And um, there hasn't been a lot of work on the images in children's literature as yet. This is changing, especially now that um, the study of graphic novels and comics is becoming more prominent. Um, but <coughs> finally, people are starting to pay attention to the fact that the images are important as well. And of course, that opens up a possibility for dialogue between art specialists and literature specialists. So there is a lot to be said about the way text and image interact. Um, and I think there's a lot to be said as well about the way we use images in our modern di digital culture. So that is a space where we want to think more about interdisciplinary study. Okay, 
children's literature and politics. Um, I just love this. This was from Puffin Picture Books way back. I think it was in the 40s or maybe the 50s. The Magic of Coal. And I liked it because I thought it was particularly relevant given recent political events as well and the way that certain um, groups in our society felt when different political ideas were being toted during various campaigns. Um, this was a study that was done about how children's literature, and it might not have been the main canonical text that you would recognize, but things like popular girls' mysteries, science fiction, um, history books, this kind of sort of um, semi-commercial children's informational books, how these were used to support political agendas during various times, but especially during the 1960s and the Cold War. So we might not think about it very often, but children's books often do end up being a site for <coughs> acculturation. Whoever produces those books usually has an agenda, and those agendas become encoded in those texts. So if you want to think about politics and history, a good place to start looking is in the children's literature that was produced at that time. And again, that opens up opportunities for dialogue between literature specialists, history specialists, politics specialists. And this is the last one. Again, this is one that's pretty close to my heart. Um, children's literature and the STEM fields. And again, we don't think of it very often, but where do we get our impressions about science, about who belongs in which professions? We get them from the things we read as children and the impressions that we form as children. So the more children's books that show women particularly in these fields or show diversity in these fields, the more likely we are to encourage children then to grow up and want to be in those fields. And um, the book that I chose for this one, Viva Crumb, this features a female scientist. She's a bit of a genius, um, typical kind of teenage sci-fi, but it is one of the few examples of a female scientist who does well and doesn't kind of get encouraged away from being a scientist throughout the course of the book. And that actually is the last of my examples. So now I kind of want to open it up to the room and hear what texts you guys read and how you think you might bring those texts to whatever it is you are studying. And since I'm not right now in the classroom, <laughs> I'm not going to pick on people. I'm going to trust you to be grown-ups and put your hands up. Go ahead. I saw your hand. I did see your hand. <laughs> I'm interpreting. Oh, <laughs> I'm sorry. <laughs> well, you know, I can start. One of, one of the things that I was wondering, you know, since you brought up the issue with the images, yep. I started thinking of uh, Lewis Caron and, you know, Alice in Wonderland. Yep. Because that was a real Alice. Yep. And then he photographed her. Mm -hmm. And then years after photographs came out, and mm -hmm. you know, uh, uh, the moment that you started actually showing that image, just reminded me the picture that I saw. And um, yeah, I think that's really really interesting. Um, and I, I think also that a lot of children's literature come up with some kind of a component of fantasy. Yeah. Right. So is, is is that a significant point? Yeah, I think so. And particularly um, when you bring up the reaction that you have to those images, I think there's room there for exploration in terms of psychology and, and cognitive studies as well, because we do tend to have an emotive response to images, especially when they're in conjunction with powerful words. Um, so I don't know if that answers your question. Partially? Partially. Well, I wonder what your thoughts are on this. You know, when you're reading books, perhaps children's literature, it's through the lens of who you are and your experiences and all those things <coughs> to that point. So, for example, in uh, The Giving Tree, yep. I look at The Giving Tree a lot different when I read it to my children mm -hmm. than I do now when I pull it off the shelf and read it, having you know paid for college. And now I can kind of see why that stump would be so happy. <laughs> someone would just come and visit them, you know? That, oh, you know, I can see that in a good sort of thing. <laughs> In high school, I read Catcher in the Rye, yeah. and I thought it was the greatest book in the world. And several years later, uh, my wife uh, was in for surgery, and I saw Catcher in the Rye in our library when I was principal. So I was, oh, I'm going to read this again. And then when I read it at that stage of my life, I, th I thought it was a pretty stupid book. <laughs> so I'm not sure. I mean, do you 
is there some sort of relevance there when you're, you're teaching uh, students or even within these other fields as to considering where they are at that point in their life? Absolutely, yes. So there is um, a saying in the study of children's literature, which is that children need windows and they need mirrors. And I think that applies equally to any reader, not just to child readers. So it suggests that, first of all, when you read something, you want to see yourself in it. You want to see what's familiar. You want a mirror. And if you, you lack that, then you start to lose your sense of who you are. But at the same time, you also need windows. You need books to open up to you other worlds, other possibilities. Without that, we don't get a sense of diversity. We just end up repeating ourselves back to ourselves. So I think that holds true for what you're saying. Um, to read Catcher in the Rye as a young person and to have that wonderful experience of it was you having that window onto something you might not have had before. But to pick it up again as an adult and have that different reaction is almost you also having that window and remembering back to what it was and how you have changed and to experience yourself moving through time. Does that help? Yeah, I think, you know, when I was in four to eighth grade middle school, you know, you deconstruct the text, you teach them all the strategies and all this stuff, you know, but there's this whole other piece that allows you to expand as a person and, you know, that, that piece can't be missed either. Yeah. I think in the, the day and age of test and accountability, which will probably go down as dark days of education, I think a lot of that, you know, got lost because the answers had to fit into A, B, C, or D. And they couldn't be these wonderful, there's no wrong answer, just explore with it. Absolutely, yeah. And I think children's literature, because it, it's so dynamic, um, it has to be because <coughs> the children grow up and then you need new texts for the new children. So in some ways, they're, they're a lot more current. Um, and if you're keeping your eye on that pulse, then you're keeping your eye on what people are passionate about at that moment. <coughs> Go ahead. Um, I, was just, I mentioned earlier about how Hunger Games was like my first series to read. And for me, I remember after she gave me that assignment like, to read the books, she also saw that I had an interest in writing. But at the time, like I was like had a hearing problem, so I couldn't hear myself when I read, so I always have a sl slower reader than other students in class. Mm -hmm. She said, so over the summer, just write anything you want. Write as much as you want. So over the summer, I actually ended up writing like three different chapter books. And then I like left one of them open on the computer screen and my older sister, who, who was only interested in a very specific type of reading, mm -hmm. read it. And it was like 67 pages typed up. And I like she came to me the next day and said, that was a really good story when you're gonna finish it. And I said, you actually read that? And it was like shocking to me because I didn't expect her to read it. But I didn't really get <coughs> into writing or even want to be an English major or a communications major if I, didn't, if I was introduced to Hunger Games at that time in, in middle school. So it offered you that window as well to yourself. That's a, a wonderful story. Other comments in the room or questions? Go ahead. Should children's literature be more timeless and current? Because I imagine the most popular series, you know, ones maybe written by Dr. Seuss or Lewis Carroll 50 to 100 years ago, I don't have the statistics at hand, but they seem like they haven't fallen out of popularity. Absolutely, and it's really difficult for us to say what's still going to be popular, say, 10 years from now or <coughs> 20 years from now. So Dr. Seuss, you know, he was popular in the 70s. He's still popular now. We can say he's probably going to stick around for a while. Um, we, c we can only try and judge what will be popular later on. So yes, I think you're right. There's an element of both. It is important for a text to have those universal timeless qualities, but then it's also really important for them to speak to the issues of their time. So, you know, a book like The Lorax, um, yes, it has that universal appeal, but it is also about environmental degradation. So that could be one reason that it is still popular because that's still an issue. I'm going to throw that one out to the room. What do you think? Should, should children's literature have that timeless universal quality or is it really important for it to be specific? And current, go ahead. I think, I think it's a good to have a balance of both because also, like like you said, like it also relates to history and a point of like to e even teach children about the, the issues of our past, but also like making sure they're knowledgeable in some sense about what's going on in their present day and time. <coughs> like even now, like it's like um, most ki most children now are wrapped up in technology. Yeah. Like my two-year-old nephew knows how to work a tablet better than I do. Honestly, he's two, so that's a little bad, but still. But um, we get to see the dynamic of how we were when we were kids, how they are now, but still some of the stories we've read still teaching the same lessons that we learned when we were growing up. So that's still important, even though we know that it's a different time. Yeah, 
I think it's a risk you take as a children's writer, is the risk that if you do make it too specific, you'll have picked the wrong thing to focus on and you will fall out of fashion. And it does happen. You know, there are, there are countless children's books that have been lost for precisely that reason. They're just not relevant anymore. Um, but there are others that hit the nail on the head. And I guess that is down to the writer and what they choose to write about. Well, kind of getting to that point, though, it seems like, well, well humans really don't, don't change. The only thing that does change is the, the, the technology. So when you're writing a book, you should be writing about the human experience for that time of that person's life. And whether you write about your characters riding a horse or riding a motorbike, it doesn't, doesn't matter. You've got to get to the heart of <coughs> what that human is feeling at that time, because that really doesn't change yeah. uh, throughout, throughout the years. And that's what would make a book, uh, time, uh, I guess, uh, timeless at that point. Yeah. So... So the context, the issues, those can be mm -hmm. specific, but the human reaction we're going to assume should be feel, universal. You know, and so, yeah. I was going to branch on what she just said is also focusing more on the morals that we expect our children to have eventually when it comes to these complex issues and what in our society, because like you said, society is always changing. There's always going to be different issues, but how are we raising our kids to counteract these issues? How are we expecting mm -hmm. them to to act when these situations <coughs> come to them in their lives. Yeah. So that's what we mean by, by the timeless aspect of it. That's what I'm saying. And so now so. to kind of bring it back around to sociology again, I'm going to pick on that word that came up in what both of you said, which was our, our children. Um, are we assuming a universal hour for children? So Can just follow up from what he said? Because yeah. this is so brilliantly timed, so I wanted to thank you for that. But mm -hmm. I'm teaching an advanced comp right now, and there's usually a thematic thing. So ours is animals. And people love that topic. But one of the things we're talking about, and I may need to ask you about this later, is what in one of our readings, the book Goody Two Shoes was taught to children as a way to teach them how to relate to animals. And so one of their topics <coughs> that you can write about is how do children's books featuring animals foster certain humane responses to creatures mm -hmm. as well as you know, the opposite sometimes that happens. But um, I thought that this was a wonderful point that both Maria and then he brought up, that <clears throat> they do foster a kind of understanding of things. And there's so many picture books with animals in them. Yeah. You know, and, you know, the Little Bear books by Maurice Sinbach, mm. those are my favorites, you know, Little Bear going to the moon. You know. <laughs> <laughs> and it, and, and just <coughs> children's books with animals, I think, is its own category. It is, and there's a, been a lot of study done on it because attitudes towards animals have changed significantly from the Enlightenment mm -hmm. period to now, mm -hmm. and that has been reflected very clearly in children's books because so many of them do feature animals, sentient or otherwise. Um, so you have things like Black Beauty. Did anyone read that? Is it? Yeah, so attitudes in that book towards the animals um, by today's standards might be considered pretty horrific. The things that happen to the horse in the course of that book and what is considered acceptable and what is considered something you should teach a child not to think about an animal. So moving from you know, uh, m even decades ago, the idea that humans have a right to steward animals, that we, we kind of, we have a responsibility towards them but only because we're superior towards now, <coughs> you'll find a lot of books that treat animals as equals or want children to treat animals as equals and everything in between those two positions. So yeah, it's a, it's a topic. <laughs> <laughs> Definitely. Other questions? Other comments? Sure. Another little question. How is this uh, being used for field flying science, psychology, and, and mark, mark, mark marketing, and, and neurology? I mean, are, can you take a look at these things with either what children write or what children respond to and say, well, uh, this is, uh, you know, correlating with their, their growth of their brain. Uh, so at this stage, they should be liking this. And at this stage, they should be liking that. Definitely. And of course, um, and that goes over to then, you know, how you're going to mar market your toys and your candy yeah, to the kids. Yeah, so I mean, <coughs> people are definitely trying. Um, obviously, it's a, a huge and complex and continuingly developing fields as anything in science is. Um, I know there is at the moment a new psychology field called narrative psychology that looks at how people construct their own identity narratives based on the narratives they read. So that's something that I've seen <coughs> uh, 
emerging in psychology, and it's been emerging from the psychology side. We keep getting papers which we have to say, this is a wonderful idea. Thank you very much. Please learn something about children's literature before you resubmit your paper. <laughs> um, but definitely there is interest coming from those fields in terms of that and, and cognitive studies as well. Um, in education, there has always been interest in what children's brains are capable of in terms of the literature that you're going to use to teach them to develop to the next level. And also in terms of marketing, because children's book publishers and children's product creators like to have things in age groups mm -hmm. and so yeah so they want to know what brains are capable of at what stages and what's going to be appropriate and there's also been counter research done that suggests that that is mostly marketing hype and is there for the marketers rather than the children and that actually these age groups are pretty arbitrary so there is definitely a lot going on there <coughs> yeah <coughs> <coughs> any other questions I can bring an example from my daughter's experience. So I have 11 and 6, and um, now the older one started reading a lot of different things, but because of her interest in animals, she just picked up this warrior cats, which turns to be... <laughs> yeah, it is. So, well, uh, no, she dropped that years okay. ago. But, um, you know, we have the entire series right now, but you know, the interesting thing that she dropped the reading the entire series, she found out that the author was a basically collection of authors, and mm -hmm. it's a highly industrialized production. <coughs> yeah. And she thought that it was inauthentic at that moment. Yeah. And then she started not reading it anymore. That's really interesting. Um, I know someone else had a similar experience when they found out that Nancy Drew had been, so it had been written by one original author and then they had redone the series yeah. later on and, and same thing, um, the, the sense of authenticity was gone. So there's definitely something to be said about the relationship between the phantom author and the reader. Yeah. yeah. about the whole, uh, it seems like for me, the emergence of the, of the graphic novel beyond the comic book. Yeah. And I'm intri intrigued by the international discussion that can occur without words with a graphic novel. And, you know, I think of other Japanese productions of, I mean, is that becoming like a subset of young adult <coughs> literature? I mean, I don't see it. I've seen some, it's <coughs> a means of communicating across cultures in a way because of the reliance on uh, image. Yes. And is that also reflective of the change of how people are getting information as opposed to reading? I always use the New York Times. It used to be this big, and now <laughs> it's like a weekly reader. Yeah. And articles are shorter, and it seems like another version of getting to the essence, perhaps, of a story or a tale, and to the point it's images. Yeah, I think that's true. This is a little bit outside of my area of expertise in terms of the the foreign the kind of so japanese sort of manga <coughs> it's definitely it is it's yes i'm thinking about a lot of manga uh, are read by uh, by quite young people or whatever so I mean, yeah in, in, middle school, high school, or whatever. Not that manga is necessarily only for them. Uh, it's in translation, but again, the image really carries a, a whole story. lot. The, the, you, you can translate <coughs> and, uh, um, you know, just put, put different words in there. It just seems like it has but there's some the ability that have to no go across languages and yeah. across cultures because yeah. of the reliance on them. No? Well, there's there's some graphic novels that actually have no <laughs> words at all. That, Those are really right. there was one, and I've been racking my brains today trying to, to remember the name of it. But it's set of <coughs> it's European. It seems to be playing with the idea of World War One, but it's all images. I've got to go home and, and find it. So like, oh, that's what it is, or whatever. I think but I think anyone can the read arrival. that. And, <coughs> yeah. and uh, um, sort of defining at higher level, when I say higher level, it's not adult, but young adult, I believe, mm -hmm. yeah. or, or even, you know, the middle school to high school. But uh, uh, but I'm wondering, I mean, I'm not sure if probably high school students <coughs> think of that. I think of that particular uh, war graphic novel as really something more for adult, uh, adults are going to oh. relate to it a lot more. 
And what I love <coughs> is the way that graphic novels have expanded into adult readership, yeah, too. Absolutely. And it's a bridge. Yeah. Definitely the one you've mentioned is used a lot in classrooms as well for precisely <coughs> that reason. There were two hands, because there's more I want to say, but um, I think I saw yours first. Yeah, uh, I was just going to comment on, like, the, like I'm not a big manga reader, because I refuse to read a book backwards, but <laughs> besides that point, um, <laughs> um, just the aspect of the Japanese culture when they came up with just the term anime, when he translated, because mm -hmm. anime branched off from manga, mm -hmm. and it's just because there's so many so many topics that it varies across the age range that it became very huge in the United States like even within the past few years. So mm -hmm. we've seen a raise in even the purchases of manga in the United States. So like I'm not sure if you guys heard like this show called My Hero Academia, which has become really, really big now and but the manga series is actually mm -hmm. starting to sell more among young ages versus mm -hmm. the actual D V D show copy. So mm -hmm. It's just showing like how kids see that visual. They want to see something that's exciting. They like to see those pictures. Yeah. And also, it's not even just in kids. It's actually in young adults and adults. So it's like across the ages. And I've definitely seen, I mean, just you walk into a Barnes & Nobles now, and you can see near the front, they have graphic novel um, renditions of all the classics. <coughs> so you can get the graphic novel Lovecraft, yeah. the graphic novel Jane Austen. So mm -hmm. definitely yeah. there the seems to be. History things, yeah. the graphic novel things. Uh, graphic novel uh, Dust Capital basically done yeah. in graphic novel. Yeah, and they're actually, they're, they're really good. <laughs> yeah, they are. I love <laughs> Which them. You don't want to admit, but they are really good. So well, they're, they're clearly well, I don't think it's a new thing. I'm sorry. Um, it's that the, because I remember growing up, even in mm -hmm. Turkey, that mm -hmm. the graphic novel, uh, you know, of classics. Mm -hmm. classic so I, comics. Right, classic yeah. comics. They like classic comics US came out with the, like in, in children's magazines that we had episodes. So yeah. I think. Yeah. 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 Those do go. Those definitely do go back. I remember classic. Com I don't know what the Turkey may have had a different brand or whatever, but uh, something called classic comics. You would have like Robinson Crusoe. Exactly. I think that's the same thing. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. Those are fun. You've been waiting ages to make your comment. No, um, I teach middle school English as a second language and English classes, and. Um, exactly what you said, though. You said you won't read them backwards, but I think our kids are getting them because. They want to read them backwards, mm -hmm. you know, and exactly. then, you know, it's just different. And they'll bring them to me and they'll be like, oh, look, this is backwards, Mrs. Barry. I'm like, no kidding. Yeah. It's like, <laughs> if you get any Chinese book, it's backwards, too. Like, like they just don't <coughs> know, and they, you know, it's, so it makes it exciting for them. Um, with my ESL kids, I will print, um, I have a program where I can pre-teach the Boston Tea Party, mm -hmm. and it's through a graphic novel, or a graphic yeah. A short, no, yeah. I don't want to say novel, but <coughs> a short story just yeah. to a, get them. A technique the I used a lot as a teacher was getting my students to write topics as graphics rather than mm -hmm. essays. Um, they love that. And they have to <coughs> use a different part of their brain as well to produce mm -hmm. that. So, um, Something that has come up in my research recently is the the similarity there is between what you need in terms of interpreting the layout of pictures in a graphic mm -hmm. novel and the way your brain interprets, for example, a web page. Um, and so that might yeah. link to what you're thinking yes. of. Yeah. But, um, I, I think I did. Kids, in addition to having to read the book backwards, the cliches are different. They're unfamiliar. Yeah, yeah so they're or exciting. They're not particularly too unfamiliar. I wouldn't. Uh, I don't think we'd ever see a kid taking interest in Russian children's literature, but they do love Japanese children's literature. Yeah, I think sometimes as <coughs> well um, fan studies and fan culture comes into it because there's a sense of being part of a group when you are into the same genre as somebody else, and so that's a big part of youth culture. Yes? I'm not very familiar with graphic novels exactly. I may have read one, but I didn't even know. <laughs> <laughs> so, well, there's so lots of pictures. <laughs> well, have lots of pictures, but is it all just pic pictures on little text? Or it, th there's two or interpretations. Well, then given that, are, are they all, uh, can some, some of these take pictures being black and white, and there's some color. Yeah, nice a, a, yeah according to some scholars, graphic novels are basically just a, a fancy term for comic book because comic book is not considered elite enough. Oh, and according to yes. others, <laughs> according to others, the difference is that comics tend to be serialized, whereas graphic novels can stand alone. They can be just the one story. Okay. 
do one uh, do uh, any research on the impact of whether the, the graphics were in color or in black and white? There has been yeah. some, usually yeah. on specific studies. So, mm -hmm. um, for example, th there's one that I've looked at recently called Decelerate Blue, which um, most of it was in black and white, but key moments, emotive moments in the story were suddenly rendered in color. Mm -hmm. So usually it's, it's kind of specific studies like that. I don't know if any comprehensive look at that from an art perspective has been done. Um, be that would be really interesting. See if you, you get more out of your, your story, yes. you know, depending on how the, you know, the thing is laid out, what color it was. Yeah, uh, definitely. People get a lot out of mouse, e even though it's black and white, just because of the starkness of it and mm -hmm. uh, the uh, uh, Holocaust uh, <coughs> mouse is a, a Holocaust graphic novel. Is it? And uh, uh, sometimes it has to do with the um, publishers, like the price of the book. It's a lot cheaper to uh, do a black and white book than it is to start laying in color. Right. And yeah. so there can be publishers' decisions <coughs> which way it goes uh, too. But well, that that doesn't answer your question about the impact on it. Uh, right, because yeah. color will have more, uh, yeah, I don't know, I kind of assumed, you know, it was like, wow, look at all that versus black and white. You're like, yeah, okay. Well, yeah. they've been, um, so. graphic novels have been referred to as both slow literature and fast literature in that a graphic novel, because it often goes through an independent publisher and it doesn't have to go through one of the big five, it, it can be um, much closer to those who produce it. Um, and people used to, well, still do actually, circulate zines, you know, their own handmade comics. And so they can be quite subversive in that way. You can get them through and get them out quick. Um, but at the same time, they're hand-drawn. They're literally, you see the trace of the artist on the page. Nothing there is kind of, it is mechanically produced, but it has to be hand-drawn first, including the lettering. So in that sense, it's very slow literature. It can't just be turned out mechanically in the same way that texts can. So I think color would come into that as well, whether you took the time <coughs> to, to color those images. Yeah, there's, um, I mean, we ha we're surrounded by images, and, and uh, but s students and, and people outside of school don't know how to read them. It's pretty. <coughs> So I would think that children's literature, children, you know, the illustrations, graphic novel would be a way of teaching visual literacy. Because mm -hmm. mm -hmm. I, I yeah. teach visual literacy as part of uh, on the grad program here. And <coughs> it's, it's hard. It's harder than, it's, it's more complex in many ways than, than reading text. It is. Really and amazing. yeah, and I think it's something that you learn when you're in primary school. Mm -hmm. What is it called here? Elementary school. Yeah, you, it's something you learn in elementary school. You learn how to interpret images, and then you forget it again as quickly as you can as you move into high school, um, because you're told that that's childish, and now you're looking at text. And I think that's going to change because of the fact that we're now inundated with visual media <coughs> on all sides. Definitely. This half of the room is very quiet. Okay, yes. So I, you know, you, you mentioned something about, um, and I, it, it, it was brought up again, that how it is kind of implanting the values mm -hmm. of a generation, the kind of books that they are exposed to. Yeah. So um, like that it has a propagandistic value, if you think yes. about it. Yes, it uh, does. You, you called it enculturation, which is a bit much nicer term <laughs> than propaganda. But I think that it, it is there. There is this appetitic um, quality into it that you, you just create different kind of experiences and values in, in children's literacy. And then I think the second part of that comment or the question is, because I'm going to ask you what you think about that, is that um, and generations also, they grow up with their books. Like, I don't think they really leave them behind, right? Mm -hmm. think, think about um, like The Hobbit or The Lord of the Rings. Yep. So it's, it's, it's because it's so popular, it's because I think the generation that grew up with it didn't leave it behind. <laughs> yeah. So, so yeah, what, what do you think about that? Yeah, no, I absolutely agree. That, that is definitely what is happening. This is one of my particular areas of interest because we like to think that our children have access to books and therefore our children have access to stories and therefore all children have access to stories and it's a nice universal democratic thing. But actually it's not. Books are full of propaganda and whoever is in control of the production processes and whoever has the money to have the education to be able to produce the book that then works its way through that system, those are the messages that get out there. And so there is a lack of diversity in the literature that's out there. It's getting better, but it is not brilliant. And I think the production processes are as important sometimes as the text themselves because there is an implicit 
pedago pedagogical purpose and uh, didactic purpose in pretty much all children's literature. Yeah, I think absolutely. Yes. I was just going to say, kind of like when he said, like, we're growing up the literature, head of science, you know, here about Harry Potter. Yeah. Like, Harry Potter was like, it's our generation growing up with Harry Potter. Mm -hmm. Like, you really grew up the books, you grew up the stories, you were there as they were released. And, <coughs> like, when the story actually came to an end, it was just like, oh, it's over. It's just like, oh my God, it's over. <laughs> so it was like a different aspect of it, but you learned a lot of lessons throughout Harry Potter. Yeah. So it's just. Uh, show of hands, who did actually read and, um, yeah, well, who read Harry Potter? I read one of them. Okay. And anybody in here, like, just avoided it, um, sure principle, hated it, never wanted anything to do with it? Because <laughs> there were a few of those. <laughs> no. Okay. Um, I, j I just, I find it interesting what you say, because a story like that has been <coughs> celebrated as getting a whole generation to read. Um, which I think is probably reasonably true. A lot of children who wouldn't otherwise have read have read, but then it's also been <coughs> lambasted for getting them to uncritically accept some very problematic ideas that were there in the series. So I'd actually like to ask what you think of that since you read it and you enjoyed it. Uh, which, 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 which was some of the problematic? Did, was there anything in there that you found problematic or did you think, think it was a fairly... Like as a kid, like as a kid, like analyzing it, I just saw, I paid attention to the heroic story of it. Mm -hmm. Like growing, like growing up now, looking at the story, like me as an adult, I can yeah. see other messages, like as an, if an adult was interpreting the story, they can see the, those, some messed up messages mm -hmm. in the story. But as a kid growing up, I didn't pay attention to those messages. I paid attention like, okay, there was an issue, but there was also the fact that what the main character did to overcome those issues. So yeah. it also comes down to the lens that the children are having when they're reading these stories. Definitely. The lens I had when I was reading these stories, I didn't pay attention to those maybe controversial issues that mm -hmm. you may say like, oh, you're exposing the children to because as a child, I didn't, I wasn't noticing those issues until maybe an adult told me about it. So it also depends on like, even as when you're saying like, oh, you don't want your kid to read this story, mm -hmm. well, how, watch how you're telling them not to read it because you may be putting that seed in their mind saying like, mm -hmm. okay, <laughs> this is the issue that you should, why you shouldn't be reading this and that's when that's going to make them notice it. Yeah. If they're noticing the actually the positive part of it and you put that negative thing in their head, that's what's going to bring it to life. For me, reading Harry Potter, I didn't pay, or any other story when I was a kid, I wasn't paying attention to like those social, really big views of it as a child. I was focusing on the morals, the adventure of it, that aspect of it. As an adult now, now an English major, I have to learn how to analyze text and see deeper meanings behind things. I can see those things now. Yeah, definitely. Go ahead. I was gonna. Do you teach any classes with like comparative children's literature? Um, I took a in college. I wasn't an uh, was an English major and history minor. Or I'm sorry, English major minor, <laughs> history major. And I took a class on comparing American children's literature to Japanese children's literature. And I thought you had said in the beginning of your presentation that they most of the research was on English texts. And is that is that and European and, culture? So yeah, I just wonder kind of what the comparative literature, do you ever teach that or is that? I do not personally teach it. Yeah. Um, I, I wouldn't feel qualified to teach it to be honest. I've had no exposure to texts in pretty much any culture with the possible exception of Latina. Um, I, th I've done a little bit in that section, but um, it's, it's a small, it a small field. field? Yeah. Um, there is a push to get more researchers in other languages and in other cultures. Um, Japanese, I know <coughs> they have their own scholars working in those areas. Chinese, I think, do as well, but there's not a lot of contact between those scholars and mm -hmm. those working in mm -hmm. European and English children's literature, so there's a lot more work that needs to be done in those fields, definitely. Yeah, it was taught by a Japanese professor. Yeah. But, but I just didn't know if it was, you know, when you're in college, you don't know if this is like, there's a million classes like this, or yeah. there aren't a lot, so it's kind of No, I think that's that quite, something quite that's unusual and quite yeah. interesting, <laughs> and we definitely need more of it. Yeah. What are these particular issues in Harry Potter? <laughs> <laughs> I, I'll, I'll bring out just a few of them. So um, the big one that comes up a lot is there's a quote in the first book, um, there is no right and wrong, only power, and those too weak to seek it out. And although that's touted as being the bad guy's point of view, um, throughout the book you actually see most of the characters adopting that way of behaving. 
Um, and the other one that comes up is the fact that none of the women have key roles. Um, the women always step back. So those are the two that get criticized a lot in Harry Potter. That's what I was going to mention earlier. But I think that that <coughs> still has an impact on the children as a reader. So for example, you know, just your example there, all doctors are old white males, all mm -hmm. scientists are males. All, I mean, yeah. that came from somewhere, and it came probably through through the propaganda, maybe purposeful or <coughs> of these books. Absolutely. I mean, that example that they have up there, where they had the children, they did a study where they had children draw what they thought a scientist looked like, and most of them were drawing, you know, a white male in a lab coat, and. Um, they've got that image from somewhere. And as we said, like our, our culture is one of images. Where are those images coming from? Well, when you're a child, they're coming from what you read and what you watch. Yes. Yeah, I was going to say, because that, cause that could ties into, like when we're talking about children, I, like, I might not have any kids, but I have 27 nieces and nephews, so it always feels like there's a kid. There. <laughs> <laughs> so um, like experiencing different ways how they learn, learn things is not just either through books, they learn through TV, they learn yeah. through even the experience. So if, let's say you take a child to a doctor, like in their doctor is a male doctor, <coughs> and if they've seen multiple doctors, and they're always oh. going to come to the assumption that okay, that's what the ideal doctor looks like. Yeah. So it's also how even so even <coughs> through our literature, it also shows how our literature expresses what our society is. Definitely. So it also <coughs> plays on that too. Like they they connect the dots as far as real experiences to their literature, and that's why I said as far as when they're reading books, if they aren't noticing things on their own, if someone does put that thought in their head that's their real life connection to it and they're going to draw on it and then express it. Absolutely. And I know fantasy gets um, kind of knocked as being not serious or not real world enough a lot of the time. But there's some work being done in cognitive studies at the moment that suggests that human beings create um, what they call schemas for how they should behave. And they can be personal schemas, how I'm going to behave today, or they can be social schemas, you know, how things happen in my society. But they do that through each narrative they read. And each time you read a new narrative, you update your schema, the, the way your brain works. Um, and the suggestion in one study that I read was that speculative fiction, so sci-fi, fantasy, horror, etc., they offer opportunities for updating those schema. They show you how the world could be as opposed to how it is right now. And that that's really important when you're thinking <coughs> about educating the next generation to do things better than they are done at the moment. You need to offer them visions of what that better would look like. Fantastic, Jennifer Bright. Yes. 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 Thank you very much.